further ado, John Gein. Okay, I encourage you to ask questions. If you have a question, ask. That way we cover the things you're interested in. I started uh, wood turning a couple years after I took early retirement from the Agilent and Hewlett Packard. And about three years ago, I decided, well, I'm going to take the plunge and uh, put a vacuum system on my uh, lathe. And boy, that's a lot of money to put on there just to take the stuff off the bottom of the bolt. And got to looking at it, doing a lot of reading, and found out there's a lot of good articles out there on how to assemble a vacuum system, but very little information on what it actually does and how it works, and what's good and what's bad, and that type of thing. How do you fix it when it's not working right? And out of that, uh, I got interested in correcting some of the stuff, putting some information out there that will help people. Now, the, I think it's February, no, somebody pulled the things. But anyway, there's an article in 2011 about the basics of, uh, in the American Wood Turner, basics of vacuum systems, uh, how they work, how to fix them if they're not working quite right, stuff like that. And then uh, in June of 2012, there is a follow-on article on what I refer to as uh, compliant vacuum chucking. Now, I don't know how many of you have looked at these things up here, but if you're observant on some of these, there is absolutely no, uh, no holes, no cutting or anything on the bottom of these bowls. Uh, so that uh, I developed a technique to where I can mount these things without damaging anything other than what we just want to turn. Now, we probably won't get to that part today but I gave a demo similar to this down at Front Range last year, about a year from now. And David wants me to do another uh, program this year. He hasn't told me the date yet. But it will probably be like a follow-on to this program and what we did before. Uh, there will be a little bit of overlap, but I want to give you the full speed. What is the vacuum? Anybody know? Yes. What's the vacuum? Okay, it has something to do with the atmosphere. What about the atmosphere? The absence of air. Okay, the absence of air, okay. So if you have a vacuum inside of something, it has less air inside than it does outside. What's the consequences of that? Negative pressure. Say again? Negative pressure. Negative pressure, okay. Pressure differential. The pressure differential, is that useful? I hope so, because that's what we're going to be working with down here. Now, a lot of people, they talk about uh, vacuum, they talk about uh, different things, but they don't really understand it. There's a difference between knowledge and understanding. And part of what I'm going to try to do here tonight is give you, move you a little bit more towards the understanding. Now, when you look at the vacuum pumps, there are basically three types, or actually four types, of uh, vacuum generators that we use. One of them is the Venturi system where you have to use compressed air from your air compressor. Uh, if you have very much flow, as those aren't very efficient. Uh, another one is a diaphragm pump, and that's what this one is over here. This is a diaphragm pump where you move it up and down. Then there's a piston pump, which is this one. That one has a capacity of around uh, 3 CFM, cubic feet per minute. This one has a capacity, I think it's a rated capacity of around seven, six or seven, so we're looking there. Then there's a rotary vane pump uh, that's used quite a bit in air conditioning. And it's, uh, it is a spinning wheel inside of a cylinder, slightly offset, and it's got little fingers sticking out or veins that act like uh, seals around there and it does a pretty good job. Uh, there are some differences. In the rotary vein there are dry ones that run without any lubrication in the pump itself. Then there are those that are wet. They have oil in there. Uh, 
I would recommend against uh, oil-based or wet rotary vane vacuum cleaner, vacuum system. The problem is that for air conditioning, it's okay because they're not moving much air through there. They're, they're hopefully your air conditioning system is sealed. With the stuff we're doing, there's always air going through there. That air goes through there, it brings oil out. And I've had some big messes in some cases from those uh, systems. And I've seen some articles where people do a lot of work to capture all that oil. Okay. So let's, let's look a little bit at uh, uh, what a vacuum can do. There's a jar, right? And let's see. Okay. Plug this in. It's not too noisy. Now, if I close this, uh, on this system over here, I've got this little bitty vacuum gauge here. It's kind of hard to see using that thing. And we're, uh, I've got these closed, so I'm going to open this up. And it's going up around 22 or so inches of mercury. Now, if you're worried about vacuum gauges, very few of them that we can afford are calibrated. So what you may have a situation that uh, you put three vacuum gauges on the same place and you get three different answers. But think of it as uh, working for with a relative measurement as opposed to absolute. By relative, I mean you start here, you make a change, and it changes from that standard. And you just get some pretty good stuff going. Over there, when I start using that system, I've got a large dial vacuum uh, gauge. Hopefully, you can see a little bit better. Okay, so we've got around 22, 22 and a half, and this is a bottle. That's what vacuum can do. Everybody see that? Anybody didn't see it? Are you in here? Okay, that's a lightweight plastic bottle. Oh, shoot, I can crush that with my hands. So, is that a big deal or not? Well, vacuum, this, this can also happen with your uh, uh, bowl that you're working with or other objects. If you get it too thin and get too much vacuum, uh, you generate, uh, generate wood chips. Now, this other thing, I'm going to have to have somebody help me for a minute. But what I'm going to do Hopefully, I'm going to show you that this thing has a lot of capacity. Now, this is just an aluminum plate, and this is a vacuum chuck. You recognize a vacuum chuck? Now, granted, it's going to be kind of hard to put on the lathe, but it's still a vacuum chuck. Now, if I put that down there like that and get it centered, and I turn on the vacuum, There we go. Didn't seal right at first. Okay, so we've got about 22 inches of mercury. Uh, how much force is on this thing? I'll give you a hint. It's 13.4 square inches. I give you an idea? Okay. One inch of mercury is right, roughly equal to half a PSI, one half, one half pound. So, if we got 20 inches of mercury over here, that'd be 10 pounds times 130, uh, 134, 134 pounds. I can't pull this apart. Now, Dick has agreed to pick up that 50 pound weight down there. Now, watch your toes. And it will pick it up and it does a pretty good job. So we got 134 pounds of weight on there, or force on there to hold that thing together. Now one of the things that we can do with our vacuum systems is we can, since this is open now, I can use this as a bleeder, and I can back the vacuum off on this thing. Okay. Now. Back it off enough. 
got too many restrictions in here. You can move this thing sideways. See that? You can move it sideways. Now, if we're running, uh, oh, it looks like about six, six or seven inches. Uh, let's say six inches. That'd be uh, three pounds per square, three psi times uh, thirteen. That's what about thirty-nine, thirty-nine or forty pounds. Now, I'm not putting 39 or 40 pounds on it. I move it side to side. The thing that you have to recognize is that you've got a force going this way due to the vacuum. The resistance to anything that moves perpendicular to that is strictly friction. And the friction is roughly half of what the perpendicular force is. So be careful. We'll get back to that when we get over here to our other system. That gives you a little bit of a feel for what's going on. You guys are welcome to come up and play with it later. Just watch your toes. Okay. So that's what vacuum is. It has the ability to generate a lot of force. So what we want to do next is use that capability on our lathe to hold stuff. Now if you think about it, go back to when you first started turning. Uh, there were two big problems I had anyway. One problem was tool control. And the other is, how do I mount this thing on the lathe? So one of the things that we develop over time is how to mount stuff on the lathe. A vacuum chuck is just another way of mounting things on the lathe. Uh, some of the purists, uh, I'm thinking of Mike Mahoney and Stuart Beatty, uh, say, use a jam chuck, use a jam chuck. Well, really, if you start to think about it, they're traveling around across country, and they can't carry a vacuum system with them. So they use jam chucks and stuff like that. Well, to me, making a jam chuck is a pain in the neck. So I like to use vacuum system just because it's simple. Okay, uh, first of all, we've got to apply the vacuum to the system. This, can, this vacuum system here is more compact, but it's basically the same as that guy over there. That one's laid out, you can see everything. Same things here. Uh, the only difference is that I've added some extra gauges. Don't let those confuse you. Those extra gauges are there for the purpose of uh, helping me understand what's going on so I can write some of these articles to tell you what's going on. Okay, make connections. This particular type of rotary vacuum adapter uh, slides into the hole in the spindle with 3520. And the particular manufacturer of that tool, uh, he only makes one vacuum adapter, namely this one. It fits the 3520. Now to fit other lathes, he replaces his hand wheel with uh, a hand wheel that has the right size hole in it. So he gets to spend uh, stock many pieces that are relatively cheap and only one type of the expensive part. Okay, that's made by JT Turning Tools. This one is a similar type thing. Uh, this is made by One Way. And with One Way, you've got this adapter, and every adapter is different for the particular lathe. Then these are all the same. And so you stick this on there, and you bolt it in place, and it's got some O-rings in there, and you shove it over the top of that spindle. And I think that they've got different adapters for those. Okay. Another type of adapter that you see here in advertising and so forth. Incidentally, those things cost over a hundred bucks. That one over there cost over a hundred bucks. Uh, now here's a smaller one here, Tom Catch. Scratch that one. Uh, that's the one I use in my Vic Mark at home. Used to. What's that? <laughs> Used to. Well, hopefully I get it back. Okay, this is another kind of vacuum adapter. Uh, whereas the one way and the one we're passing around cost over 100 bucks. This one I think is around 35, 45 dollars. And you take this and you shove it through your spindle and put this on this side and you screw it down and seal both ends of the spindle with these uh, parts here. The rotary part is right here. 
single bearing. Now, when you look at these things, look at the size of the hole that the air has to go through. Look at this one, look at the one that's going around, look at the one that's up here. And the size of that hole makes a big difference. Okay. Questions so far? Everybody confused? No questions? I'm not that perfect. Well, yes? If the, uh, your vacuum, isn't it like air pressure? Once you get the pressure or the vacuum on there, what difference does the size of the hole make? You're a good straight man. Basically what uh, Drew is saying, I'll word it differently. If you get your piece mounted on the lathe and you have no leaks, I emphasize no leaks, then the size of that hole doesn't make any difference. And uh, because there's no airflow. But if you have any kind of leaks at all, then you have airflow and it does some funny things. If you look at, I'm the engineer, I got a draw, okay? If you look at a graph, if you call this the flow, and this is the vacuum level, or this is inches of mercury, and this is the uh, flow rate through your system, cubic feet per minute. The type pumps that we're using are uh, referred to as constant displacement pumps. Don't worry about it. The thing to uh, remember or realize is that as a normal function, if you vary the amount of flow going through your system and uh, the vacuum is, uh, level is going to change correspondingly. Now, if you look, pick up a vacuum pump specification, it says this is a 5 CFM pump. What's that mean? Well, it does in a way. But what it does is it says that if you have nothing on the output and nothing on the input, no restrictions, then it'll be here. So this is zero vacuum, and then this is the flow rate. Now, the other thing you get into is that uh, in our systems, we don't have things with nothing on the input, nothing on the output. We have filters, we have hoses, we have connectors, we have all that stuff in there. So how does it change when you uh, put it in a real system? Well, if you measure it, which I've done, you'll start off with zero flow and you'll go down here and you'll follow that line. And then at some point it'll do like that. And that's because all of this hardware we got out here is choking the flow of the air into the system. So this brings up a logical question. What size vacuum pump should I buy? I've heard that. I've also heard people say that, well, I got a big pump. I don't care how much leakage I've got, the pump will overwhelm it. No, that's not true. Because what happens is your filter your hoses, your valves, your vacuum adapter, especially that little one over there, they restrict the flow. Your pump is capable of, say, 6 CFM, but in your system, the maximum flow you can get out here at your vacuum chuck, which is what counts, may be only three, three and a half. So the design of your system is very important. Uh, in these systems here, if you get to looking at them, I've got both quarter inch and three-eighths inch hose over here. Any place that is critical and important, I've got three-eighths inch hose. I had one system where I had a quarter inch hose in there and changed it to uh, three-eighths. The original uh, deal that I had did something like this. And I tried to change it to, from quarter inch hose to three-eighths inch hose the uh, performance improves significantly. Now, uh, some people say if it holds the bowl on there, good. Uh, that's good enough, I don't care. As long as it holds it on there and I can get my job done, I don't care. Fine, 
as long as it does your job. Uh, if you want to get the optimum performance out of it, then there are ways of doing that. Now, if you look at your pump, your pump is trying to move all this air through there. And the way I've designed my system is that all of the leakage is going to be out here in my bowl. I have essentially zero or negligible resistance or leakage back in here. Now let's look at a couple of uh, couple of uh, vacuum chucks. You can make your own or you can get a commercial one. Uh, this one, uh, this is, I think you call this tracks, that artificial stuff you use for your decks. Uh, I drilled a hole in it, threaded it, put it on my spindle, and uh, cut a groove in it. Put this as a two inch PVC, up two, up to three, and uh, glued it in there with a couple of screws to make sure that it stays put. Now, what do you use for the gasket? Anybody heard any good uh, wise tales? Yeah, there's, there's a foam that you can use. You can go down to uh, Hobby Lobby where I bought this. It's called Funky Foam. And the typical way a lot of people do it is they'll set this foam down here and they'll take their chuck and they'll set it down like that. Then they'll go around it and cut it around. Then they pick it up and they cut out the hole in the middle. Uh, it's kind of wasteful. I don't do that. I'm, I'm too tight to waste all that, uh, all that foam, all that square inches. What I do is I take that same foam and I cut it into strips. Cut it into strips about an oh, inch and a quarter, something like that. Like so. Of course I've used some of this. And I just take this stuff, I clean it off good with uh, uh, alcohol and smooth this edge up with uh, a scraper. Put it on the way and scrape it, scrape it up. You want to make sure that that surface doesn't wobble. You want it nice and flat and straight, straight just like you make a jam chuck. Then I take this and lay it down like so and glue it and just work my way right on around. And when I get back to the other end, I cut it off. So this stuff's sticking up in the air, then I bend it over and uh, glue it on the inside. Now you'll see in some of these guys, you've got some of this blue painter's tape in there. That's because any of this foam, no matter how you do it, it's going to have a stress on it. It's going to try to lift back up. So that tape is nothing there but, uh, to hold it down. It doesn't really make that much difference. On the outside, on this one, you'll see strapping tape. Others, I've got a rubber band around there just to hold it down. Now, when you get back around to where it joins, there it is. Uh, these overlaps, if you've got multiple pieces around there, if you're lucky enough, you've got one piece go all the way around, where it joins, overlap at about a sixteenth of an inch. And it works. It's simple. Uh, I've got one over here that I had to patch last night. There you go. Uh, this one had a chip knocked out of the of the foam right here, so it leaked. And I just took an exacto knife and cut down each side and cleaned it off, cut me a little piece and put it on there so that it overlaps about a sixteenth of an inch. If you overlap it more than a sixteenth of an inch, the compliance of the foam is not enough, or it will not deform enough to allow a good seal. If you overlap it a quarter of an inch or three eighths of an inch, then all of a sudden it just won't re uh, compress down and give you a good seal. Okay, let's see, this is the one I'm going to use. John? Yes? You go down to buy that stuff that's got yellow, pink, orange, green, all the pretty, pretty colors your wife will like them, or your husband, whatever, but don't buy it because it'll stay in the inside of your bowl uh, when you put it in there and you sand it again, you've already sanded it, sanded the inside of it. By the way. That's a good point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Does it always seat perfectly in there? Or okay. Is that why you've got three or four? Uh, 
I've got three or four because I'm too lazy to change them all the time. Uh, the way this is sold, this hub is sold by JT Turning Tools. Some of the same people have made that uh, rotary adapter I've got up there and the one that's passing around. Uh, it is designed to go into uh, a two inch PVC pipe coupling. And there's an O-ring in the bottom. So what you do when you start off is you, I mount this in a chuck and take a scraper and true up that edge because there's usually some little flanges on there from uh, molding. So I smooth that up. Then I turn it around, put it in here, and I seat it down there tight. And someplace on here, there it is, you see a mark? And there's a mark right here. That way, when I take it off, I put it back, I put it back in the same place. It should be okay. So if you go from uh, diameter A to diameter B, your, is, you know, that, the next piece of PVC will seat as good as that one, and it'll still be square on the end, so you won't get any bother. Correct. I can change this out. I've got, this is the only factory one I brought, but I've got some at home. I've got four inch. Well, this is a four inch. I've got some that got a three inch like that other chuck wherever I left it. And uh, you can go from two, three, and four on these couplers. Uh, there is some stuff out there in the market where you've got larger ones where you can use six inch couplers. And you go a uh, six to eight inch uh, reducing coupler. This device in the middle is nothing more than a filter. That's for accession where we talk about the compliant vacuum check. I'll pass this around and let you look at it. But yes, you can swap those out by lining those things up and getting them going correctly. Okay. I'm going to pass this around so you can see it also. When we're talking about vacuum, we're talking about inches of mercury, we talk about pressure, we talk about PSI. And it makes it a little bit easier because you don't have to say, okay, I'm pulling minus 10 PSI on my vacuum chuck. And you don't do that. You say, I got 20 inches of mercury. just makes the conversion a little bit easier. Now, I'm going to pass this around. I want you to look at it. It's setting at zero. And if you put pressure in, it goes clockwise. You put vacuum in, it goes counterclockwise. And the scales are made, uh, labeled inches of mercury and pounds per square inch. And I think it may have, uh, yeah, it's got some metric stuff in there too. That helps illustrate the difference between pressure and vacuum. Questions so far? Yeah. What are you doing with the power goes on? Duck. Pray. <laughs> Stop turning. Uh, it depends upon what you've got mounted. Uh, first of all, whenever I put something on here, as much as possible, I, I hold it together as a tailstock. So that will uh, help it stay on the, on the lathe. The other thing that can be done, it gives a little bit of help, is down here in the bottom of this thing, I've got two big pieces of four inch PVC. And they're sealed and they're, they're brought up uh, in this hose right here. And I've got the valve closed right now, but that can act as a vacuum reservoir. It can give you another five or 10 seconds. A lot depends upon how good a system you got built. If you got it built right, it's not going to leak. Okay? Question, Tom? No. Okay. Now. Do you, do you lose a lot if you have a, like a small tank in, in your system as a reservoir? You could. It doesn't make any difference what you've got as long as you've got something there. If you want it, okay? When I sent that uh, first article out, the one that was written back in 2011, there was a lot of uh, talk on the internet, or on the uh, forum, that they wanted to know, why has he got a reservoir in there? What's it good for? And the answer is, for the average wood turner, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference. But if you start getting into unique situations, then it starts making a difference. This is a little bit of testing tools. Recognize it? It's a rubber ball. Now, you guys see this uh, vacuum gauge down here? Okay, I've got this closed off. And I've got a gauge over here where I'm not even going to show you. But it tells me how much I got on the pump. And if I put my 
hand over this or put this ball over it, and I open this valve up, then it pulls back in. Okay? Now the first step is that at this point, I don't want any leaks between here and there. So how do I tell if there's any leaks? How do you tell if you got a leak in your tire of the car? Nobody's ever had a soft tire? I think somebody's talking back there. They're not talking loud enough for me to hear it. If you've got a tire that your wife says or your spouse says and it's got a leak, you go air it up and you measure the pressure and you watch it for a while and see if it stays up or if it goes down. Same thing here. Okay, we've got... Uh, I'm going to use this uh, gauge here because I can't see down there. This one I've got 22 inches of mercury. What have we got down here? Let's see. Okay. Now if I turn this valve off, that isolates it from the pump. And you see it's starting to drop a little bit. Well, depending on how fast it drops, I can get a pretty good idea of how much losses we're having in our system. Everybody agree that right now we don't have any significant losses back here? Everybody agree? Yes. I see a few heads right uh, going up and down. It was doing something, okay? Now, when I start off to mount something, I will, first thing I do is I go in here and I do a self test. Okay, put that thing on there. And to do a self-test, I take an aluminum plate or something that's uh, smooth, uniform, rigid, and put it on there. And we'll turn on the vacuum and see what happens. Well, it doesn't go up quite as far, does it? I'm reading about uh, 20 inches of mercury. 20.5 instead of 22. That looks like there may be a leak there someplace. Okay, if I isolate this again, then that vacuum is going to drop, and it's uh, the rate of drop on that, I've got enough experience with it, I get a pretty good idea how to get a seal I do or do not have. Now, when I first started doing this, when, uh, the first time I did this experiment, the thing fell off in 30 seconds. And then after I started analyzing and working with it, I could get it up to six or seven minutes. So that is a simple way of determining whether or not you got any leaks. Now if you got some leaks and want to figure out how to trace them down, go read that article. Okay. Now from past experience, I know where the leak is on this one. You notice how loose that is? What you have is every time you put a different chuck on here and so forth, you'll find that some of them are real loose, some of them are not. So what I do is a matter of course, I went out and bought 20 or 30 rolls of Teflon tape. And every time I put one of these things on, I put a, uh, about three layers of Teflon tape on this thing. And hopefully this little planned experiment works okay. And we'll be able to show that it makes a difference. That was just one of the leaks I found when I first started developing this thing. Okay, let's put this back on. Even if a person doesn't have a vacuum gauge on their system, doing this, what I call this a drop-off test, doing that simple drop-off test will tell you what I've got problem. Right? And see if it makes any difference. What's here? Yeah, oh, you. Go hide your name down. Put your finger right there and hold it. Okay? Now I'm going to turn this off. Feel anything? Did, did you feel it suck in? Okay, put your hand like that then. Okay, I've got to release the back end. Feel it move? Okay. Okay, so that moves in and out. Okay, now we got that thing on there. We got the seal on there. Uh, now let's turn the isolation valve on or close it. 
Uh, and it's a little bit different, isn't it? It's not falling near as fast. So I've got a fairly good chance of uh, working with that and having some good performance. Now what that tells me is that all of the work that that pump is doing shows up right here. It's like you're using a water, uh, water hose to put water in your garden. Uh, you want all the water to come out the end of that hose. You don't want it to be spraying all over the place else. So I've changed this, and I've worked with it so that I can uh, put all my effort right out here. Okay. Now we'll see if we can mount this little bowl on there, and we'll show you several different ways of uh, mounting these things and finding out how well they, uh, how to get them mounted and how well they work. Still there, isn't it? Shall I keep stalling? I think you, I think I made a, a, a point there that it's different. Uh, that will pull off if you break the seal a little bit. But by doing that, I know that anything else that doesn't let it work right, then uh, it's from here out. Now right now, I don't know the quality of this bowl. But let's put it on there. How are we going to center it? Tailstock. Tailstock. Tailstock, yeah. When we turned it, turned our tenant, I always leave this little nub on here with the uh, mark on it from the tailstock. So I can bring this up. Okay. Now that should be somewhat centered. It's not too bad. So now that is uh, centered on there. This is the same thing, just a jam chuck. Now, once you get to this point, don't forget to turn your vacuum back on. Because when you don't turn your vacuum back on, uh, and later on you get through and you want to move the tailstock out of the way, uh, guess what happens? It kind of moves around a little bit. Hey, what's wrong? We've only got uh, seven inches of mercury on there. How much we have before? 22? So something's wrong. What's happening? What? Leaks. Okay, wood is porous. Okay, I've only got about uh, seven inches of mercury on there. That makes me nervous turning that little thing, that little bit out of the vacuum on there. What can we do about it? Anybody got any ideas? Seal. Yeah. Spray it with water? Well, there are some people that you know, really point out that you don't want to put any liquids on there because it goes through this forest wood, it goes right on into your pump. So that's not going to work. Uh, we could take it off and go ahead and finish it, but I don't want to do that because I'm not finished here. Well, go raid the kitchen and see if it works this time. Get you some clean wrap. Put that on there. Make a difference? Yep. Okay, now that uh, helps seal that up. Now before you start turning, you'll want to put you some uh, painter's tape around this or rubber band or something to hold it because otherwise the wind generated by this will uh, proceed to tear it off. Now the other thing that we might ask ourselves is, okay, I need to turn that. What am I going to do? I need a hole through that clean wrap, don't I? How do you do that? Gouge. Yeah, use a gouge. The gouge doesn't care that that clean wrap is there. Now, I'm not going to do this completely, but basically at this point, you, you take your gouge and you go in there and you start trimming that off. And uh, you can put your foot on there, you can make the shape, whatever you want. Uh, This one here, you uh, got a nice smooth bottom on it. 
used a vacuum chuck to hold it. Did not have to build a jam chuck. Uh, jam chuck takes me a good day, five minutes, typical day, 15 minutes, to get a good fit that I'm comfortable with. This doesn't take that long. But it's a convenience item. It's another tool in your tool chest. Okay, let's play devil's advocate for a minute. Uh, when I made this thing, use your imagination, okay, I made this thing, the, uh, this little stud down here was too big. It stuck into my chuck. I had to cut it off in order to get this tin into my chuck. Okay, now what do I do? Any ideas? What's that? Leave, it on, leave the chuck on it until you and put it on the tailcoat. Okay, now that's a typical, typical trick of uh, the uh, segment turners. Uh, what he's talking about, there is a fixture that you can put on this tailstock. It goes in here and it has the threads the same as your spindle. So you can take your uh, bowl or segmented turning that you've got mounted on a scroll chuck Take the scroll chuck off the spindle, put it over here, then you put your vacuum chuck up there and you run it up and you can get it well centered. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, there's a technique to that. Let me turn this off. So it doesn't take very long for it to come off that way, does it? Okay. Not using this guy, but move it out of the way. I do not have that spigot on there. It just looks like I have. That's, that's your imagination. So I'll come up here and I will get it centered as well as I can, okay? Then I'll turn my vacuum on. That's really, there we go. Now, <laughs> what I can do is I can use a tool to help center that thing. What tool do I use? What? Tool rest. Tool rest. I have to put my arm on though. Okay, you bring this thing up. You bring it up close to the bowl and you turn this thing around. See that change? See that change right there? Okay, it's almost touching there. Then it's way over there. Now, if I reduce my vacuum enough, or in this case it leaks enough, I can now take this thing and tap it. Go halfway. I need to raise that up just a little bit. I only go halfway. And then, check it again. Okay, there's a high spot. There's a low spot. Go halfway. And you keep doing that, you can zero in on a uh, fairly good or close enough for what you need. It's not going to be as good as if you did this. Now, another, another challenge for you. Uh, when I first made this thing, I left the bottom a little bit thicker than what I well, I was, I was being cautious. I left the bottom a little bit thick and got to thinking about working with it. That thing is too heavy. It's just too heavy for me to be comfortable with. I want to change the design a little bit. So what I did is I was able to bring this thing over here and I was able to mount it on the lathe. I don't know that I use this chuck, but I use something similar to this. And now you can turn the thing on. There it goes. I got a pretty good seal on there. And I can work with it and get the thing centered. And I can go in here and finish cleaning this up on the inside. Make sense? Okay. Any questions so far? There's yet another way. I can't pull that thing off of there. And it's got a good seal on it. So you can get a good seal with wood. 
It just depends upon the particular type of work. Now, if I wanted to read, let me do something here. If I wanted to, okay, now I want to re reorient that thing or get it squared up. I can go up here with this bleed valve and bleed air into the system and bring the vacuum down. And I can bring it down enough. I usually use around 5 PSI. Now I can tap this thing and adjust it if I'm careful. Now, another, another thing I can show you. Uh, okay. You noticed a while ago that uh, I stuck this thing up there and it didn't stick, right? That happened. You ever had a bowl you could not get mounted, could not get a vacuum pulled on it? Nobody? Yeah, okay, at least one person. Okay, Monty, you tell him too. Okay, remember I said I had that vacuum reservoir down there? Okay, if I open up this valve, <coughs> now that puts a uh, reservoir in there, and it is proceeding to put an extra charge down there, so to speak. Now, watch the vacuum gauge when I open this thing up. See how it jumps up there and comes back down? Well, if you, uh, in some bowls, now remember this seal is compliant, it'll move. I have had situations where I've tried to mount something, just turning the pump on, letting it pump, I can't mount it. If I open that thing up and then hit this, I get a much heavier hit a lot quicker with that uh, reservoir down there. And that uh, gives you a faster response time. And it will mount things that sometimes you can't mount otherwise. Now another place where you might want to use a vacuum reservoir is uh, you got a remote vacuum pump. Uh, is Alan Jensen in here? Uh, Alan has a vacuum pump that was made out of an old air compressor. Now, it can be done, you just reverse the input and the output, now you got a vacuum pump. But it's noisy, he's got it sitting in the other room. And then he's got a line coming into his, uh, into, his vac into his lathe so he can use it. Now, a couple of things that happens with that. One is that you don't have a very good response. Uh, if you open the valve up and hit that thing with vacuum, you've got to evacuate all that line all the way back uh, to get some response. If you just put a simple little reservoir uh, down there next to your lathe and put it on the pump side of your isolation valve, then that will allow a lot better response. Now, the other thing that happens when you do a remote vacuum system like that, like Drew was pointing out a while ago, if you don't have any leaks, nobody cares. But if you have something that leaks, which is typical, then you want all of your capability here. Well, that long line going back to the pump is causes drops. And that drop, what it will do, this curve up here, that additional restrictions, will cause this to move this way. So where you put your pump, vacuum pump relative to your system makes a difference. Yeah? What do you make in your reservoir? PVC pipe. Scheduling. Probably. I don't know. White stuff, yeah. Let me get rid of this noise. Now, incidentally, I turned the thing off. It's got a vacuum on it. Don't try to restart it. What's that? Oh, that's all right. It's still hanging there. Nice and tight. Uh, release that vacuum. Uh, this vacuum pump here and that one there, both, if you have a vacuum on the thing, you try to start it up, it stalls. You don't want to do that. That's rough on it. It'll burn up the motors. So release the vacuum before you start uh, pumping with it. Now the uh, 
rotary vane tops. I don't know how those react to starting up. I haven't had that much experience with it. I don't know if you have to release the vacuum or not. Now another thing that happens, let me show you that real quick. Uh, let's close this valve. Now if I remount this thing, and come on. Oh, it hurts, hurts if I close the bleeder valve. Okay. Now, one of the things that some people are going to come up with is say, I don't have that isolation valve, therefore I cannot do John's drop off test. Well, it depends upon the kind of pump you've got. This pump here has reed valves in it. It's less than or the check valve. That means that the back the air will come in but it won't go back out. This one has reed valves on it. And on this one I should be able to turn the thing off and the vacuum stays there. Because that reed valve in here seals it up. Okay? Rotary vein valves uh, pumps do not have that feature. You turn you do the same thing like this with a rotary vein pump. Uh, that needle drops fast because it does not have a check valve. Monty? Even with the rotary vein, if you have that uh, reservoir and you try to start it like John says, that, that really helps a lot. But it does, when that power goes off, that baby is gone. Yeah, the rotary vein pump, you not only have leakage out here when the, when the power goes off, you have leakage back through the pump. And, uh, yeah, you want to keep hold of your piece. Because when they fall on the floor, they do break. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> any, any questions so far? Okay, do any of you ever make Christmas presents or other types of gifts? Yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. Well, the uh, show you a little thing here. We can go in and do, show you how to make a uh, simple Christmas present with very little effort. You really think your wife wants a vacuum pump? No. <laughs> I tell you though, when I started, uh, the wife wants something, I make something for it. Then she starts uh, recognizing that my tools are, are of value. Okay. Okay, here's a coaster. That coaster is made with only mounting with a vacuum shot. There it is. Do any of you ever have any scrap wood? <laughs> Nobody? Okay. Now, what we can do, I don't know who's on the cleanup crew, but I am going to make some wood chips. Okay. Like I said, some of them seal real good by themselves, uh, others don't, and I just don't want to fool with it. So put that on there. Okay, this one is made out of maple, I think. Just a little vacuum chuck. Now, when you do these, it's, it's nice to thread these things and put them right on there. There are taps, I'm sure Woodcraft's got some, that will tap that hole for you. The biggest challenge, there's two things, actually. One of them, well, on this one I made it, I put a dovetail on here, put it into a scroll chuck, drilled the hole, and then took a, uh, a tap and tapped it. Now, the problem is those taps, especially in wood, can get crooked. If it gets crooked, you start over. Uh, Monty made a nice little tool that fits, got a dovetail on it, fits down here, has a hole in it that the shaft of the uh, tap fits into, and that holds it straight. Now, I have to turn it by hand, but still it, it holds it straight. The other thing, if you'll notice on these guys, 
there is a recess right here. Because what happens is you want your, your chuck, scroll chuck, vacuum chuck, um, face plate, whatever, it registers against this surface back here. That's what makes it run true. If it doesn't do it back there, it'll wobble. So you've got to put a recess on there so when this thing gets tight, that surface gets against that, that shoulder. Questions? And I, yeah, I have put too much tape on there at times and it's difficult to get tightened up. This looks like it might be one of those times. You'll also notice that this thing has holes in it so I can put a Tommy bar on it. I'm going to have to back off and get some of that. Yes, Tom? Could you eliminate the need for the tape by making a little recess on the back of that and putting an O-ring in it? Probably could. Yeah. You'd have to make it so the O-ring would completely compress it. It's still indexed off the, the spindle. But, uh, yeah, to do that, you'd probably want to go in here right in this area right here where it yeah. got that shoulder. Yeah. I wonder if I lost enough tape off of that. We'll find out quick enough. I'm spoiled. My big mark at home has a spindle lock that stays in place. Okay. Do we have a good vacuum seal? Anybody know? I would test it. Yeah, put this thing on there. Well, now if I put the ball in there, that tests the uh, leakage from the end of the shaft on out. But right now, I want to make sure that this seal is okay and the spindle is okay. So, uh, as you probably figured out by now, that's standard procedure for me. Just like most of you by now have learned, before you turn the thing on, you get the spindle in rotation, right? You want to make sure that nothing is hitting. Okay, put this on there, and we'll hit it and see what we got. Got to turn off my bleed valve. Okay. Gross leak isn't too bad. Now, if you have uh, leaks uh, in your system, if you don't have any leaks in your system, when you measure the system performance, like right now, with no leaks, your pump uh, vacuum level you draw are right here. If you start getting lower than that, then you either got leaks in your system or your pump's wearing out. Uh, this pump over here, when I first got it, it was pulling typically around 17, 18 inches of mercury. Put a rebuild kit in it, and now it pulls 22 consistently. And the maximum flow improved. Okay, let's do this check. Not too bad. It could be better, but we can probably make that work. Now, piece of scrap wood, nice round circle, isn't it? All I've done to this thing is sanded this flat. Okay, and I'm going to put it up there, and I'm going to make a coaster. The coaster is going to be this diameter. So I put this up here, and I bring my tailstock up. And this is nothing more than a template that tells me where I'm going to be doing things. The lighting's not the best ever in here, is it? Okay. Now, what I do is I just go ahead and move this thing around until it fits nicely. And tighten it up. And let's turn the vacuum on. It's pulling up there around 19, 18 inches. Uh, that's good enough for doing most of what we want to do. It's held there. Now, this is the same diameter of the coaster I want to make. So let's, let's make some chips. I have to 
thing that's like and get that high enough to work. Okay. Now, as things you already know, this is cross grain. You do not go in here and wipe this. That's going to hit the uh, end grain when it comes around and it's going to jam and it's going to cause all sorts of interesting things. Face plate work, we come in from the side and we uh, do a side cut in here. Okay, we slow the lathe down, step out of the firing lane and start it up. We don't have something centered right. I've got a center point marked on here. You're above it, John. What's that? You're above it. You're still above the center. Yeah. Come here, somebody hold the light. That's the challenge on some of these things, is being able to see what you're doing. That looks better, doesn't it? Okay. Now we reset this. We should be okay now. Doesn't have to be perfectly centered, but you do want enough row out there to do what you gotta do. Okay. Now let's try this again. What's that? At this point, it doesn't make any difference. But when I forget and take this off, it gets interesting. So yeah, keep me honest. I have done that more than once. What's that? I have forgotten to turn the vacuum back on on this thing several times. Okay, we have insurance now. Yeah. <laughs> Dick's the one who's going to need the insurance. <laughs> okay. That's better. Okay. Now, if I rub the devil on that template, I'm not going to cut it. Hey, it's cut. It's cut. It's like the slider. We might do a bunch of these things. Having these templates speeds things up, makes things simple quite a bit. And it works with things other than coasters. Anything you want, make several of them that are the same diameter. Make your template. Okay, now. Next thing we need to do is we need to determine or show what the thickness of this thing is going to be. I should have brought a smaller tool to rest with it. There we go, that'll, that'll compromise. Okay, I make these toasters about a half inch thick. Turns out that this ruler is half inch. So I can set it down there and I can mark it with that ruler. Put my pencil on the mark and turn it on. That's how thick I'm going to make my coaster. Now, as you look at that coaster, you'll see that the back side. Pencil. The pencil went down. Oh, okay. Now, 
that coaster is going to curve off to the back. So I can do that right now. And I don't have to take it off right now. Just go ahead and do that. And we'll see if we can do it without ripping it off. Keep an eye on your vacuum because you want to make sure it's good. And depending upon what I'm doing, I'll turn left-handed also. Ah. And use a little bit of shear scraping. Get down right in there. The bottom's done. Now, we're holding that with the vacuum, but uh, I always try to use the tailstock as much as possible. Now, when you're working with vacuum or any of these things, it makes a difference what kind of cut you make. Uh, I used to just go in here and, okay, line it up and cram it in there. Well, it works most of the time, but you are getting into some ingrain, so you're better off to come in here and go side grain. Now, if I do this right now, right-handed, I'm going to get a face full of sawdust. So I'll do it left handed. start hollowing out. Now if I didn't have that tail stock on there holding in place, I'd probably be in trouble. And you can smooth this up. Okay, the vacuum works okay, but it's turned on, so get this out of the way. I want to get into the center with this uh, gouge. It's a little bit on the high side yet. And you're best off to go in here with a Side cut start with. That's where your big load's going to be. Am I doing it right, Tom? It's good to me. Okay. Now you get to the point where you do have to go ahead and do some bevel rubbing. Okay, that's the basic process. Now, oh, where did my toy go? How many of you have seen these little death gauges? Well, I modified it by putting a straight piece of, it's like oak on there, and glued it in place. Uh, sometimes the glue stays, sometimes it doesn't. But now that you've got that there, I typically like to make it about a quarter of an inch deep. I can set that down there and run it across and get a pretty good idea of how well I've got the bottom uniform. At this point, you can sand the thing up and uh, sand this edge a little bit and basically you've got yourself a coaster you can uh, no scroll shot no spur center so you can do a lot of things with just 
just to vacuum check. Any questions so far? Okay, we've got about 20 minutes. I don't know that I'll be able to finish it, but I'm going to show you, start showing you how to do what I call a compliant vacuum check. Some of you looked at these pieces over here, and uh, they don't have any marks on the bottom of them. Just need some sanding. Okay. With these guys here, uh, I wanted to mount them in such a way that I could uh, turn them without actually damaging them. Did not want to damage this nice little surface back here. Uh, another thing that I do occasionally I watch for tree, tree crotches. Tree crotches have a lot of good figure in here. John, can you bring it over here so we can see? Oh, okay. The tree crotches have a lot of good figure in there. So if I can mount this up, that's kind of interesting on the back. If I can leave that that back side and haul this out here and maybe clean up the side, uh, might have something the spouse likes. And depending upon the size of the block you use, you can get different, different levels of uh, activity. Now, you gotta take this off. This is the one that doesn't fit. A couple extra hands on it. This will probably work. Called improvising. There we go. When Dick helped me load out this afternoon, I said, "Well, we got everything we need. If we don't have it, we'll improvise." That's the way we used to approach camping also. I always try to remove this excess Teflon tape because I don't want to get sucked into the vacuum system. The filters down here are absolutely necessary from that standpoint. Where'd you get that filter? I got this filter from JT Turning Tools. I'm sure there are other places, I just haven't researched them. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do, how many of you have ever seen vacuum pack coffee? One or two of you? Only that many? Okay, a few more hands. Okay, vacuum pack coffee, you've got that coffee in there, and the vacuuming pushes that, those granules together and it gets rock hard, doesn't it? Okay, that's what we're going to do here is that we're going to take advantage of the fact that if you have a granular material and you're able to pack it down tight, it will get hard. So we'll get started on that. Okay. Here's a vacuum chuck. Uh, just like the bigger version of that other one. The only difference is I got this cap stuck in there. That cap has got screen wire, got holes in the side of it, got screen wire in it. The purpose of that is to keep the, the granular material I'm going to use, keep it in here and not in the vacuum system. Make sense? Now the first ones that I did, uh, I was using, uh, using rice and I was putting plastic over this and uh, it worked, but it was a real kludge. And uh, I was having trouble with the plastic getting holes in it and leaking. And I had to go back and do some other things. Eventually had to 
do a lot of push-ups, it really kind of kludgy. And that was the system I had when I was in the symposium about two years ago. Then I went to a demonstration where Cindy was doing a demo, and she gave me a breakthrough. And the breakthrough was that, uh, got some discs around here someplace. I'll we'll use them later. Okay. The breakthrough was that she was using some of this uh, plastic, stretch plastic. Hmm. What's that? I'm looking for, I've got a, a uh, one of Trent Bosch's tool stands around here someplace. I don't see it. I know I packed it. What's that? I saw it too. Oh, well, it's here. Move on. Okay. The other thing we need is some sand or some rice. Well, everything's disappeared in here. There we go. Now, the original work that I did. I uh, just poured loose rice in here, and I got a little bit messy, a little awkward, so I started uh, putting it in the bag. And the key to this, uh, the bag helps keep it easier to handle, but it's got to be loose, got to be real loose. Everybody seen this stuff? Okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to cover this with this uh, stretch plastic you use for shipping. And it isn't too critical. You just need it over it in a couple of places. Cindy, did you know you did me a favor that day? Where'd she go? She's doing a demo on uh, the sea urchin Christmas tree orchids. Now this stuff sticks together pretty good. It's like the cling wrap or the saran wrap you've got. And it'd be a little bit nicer if I had my carving stand wherever I left it. That'd be nice. take a table and lay it out and uh, put this stuff across it. You want several layers. Okay, where have we missed it? Right there, okay. The one thing that's bad about this is it does have a tendency to stick to itself, just like cream, cling wrap in the kitchen, and uh, gets to be a little bit of pain. What I do at home, and I lay this stuff out, I put paper clips on each one of the corners, so when it does get messy like that, you can take the paper clips and stretch it out again. Now, that's not holding very good, is it? Yeah. So what we do now, if you can see this, we're going to wrap it. And you need to get all those edges down in there. And the nice thing about this stuff is it does seal itself fairly good. Okay, that's the first step. And I probably need some more stuff up here, but we can do that on the lathe. Now what I'm doing right now 
because I'm making the equivalent of a mandrel. It would help if that spindle didn't turn, wouldn't it? I can see a couple of places there where I've got gaps. So, where do I lay that there? I can take this and I can go back over it. This stuff is fairly get forgiving. It's interesting from that standpoint. Okay, now it's going to turn this way, so I kind of wrap it, you know, wrap, uh, wrap it, wipe it that way. Now let's see if we got any major leaks. What you'll see is this is going to pull down against that uh, rice, and it's going to get real hard. guys but I can hear it leaking so I'll put a couple more layers on there now what you have to do is get enough rice in there get your plastic in there and everything such that it uh, doesn't have any major gaps. If you have some major, this got a gap right here. Those gaps will allow the uh, plastic to pull down in there and it'll rupture. Okay. That's not perfect, but we'll get you the idea. Okay, where'd my, okay. Now, that's not going to do you much good, but if I can take the vacuum off of that, it's going to get soft. and I can move it around. And I can take this guy and put it right up there. Bring my tailstock up. And figure out just exactly how I want it positioned. And I'm going to say about there. And I can move it around a little bit and adjust it. Okay. I'm going to apply the vacuum. And that rice down there is getting hard. It, uh, the amount of stiffness that you have is dependent upon uh, getting a better seal on that. Uh, if we had all night, I'd fix it, aren't they? We don't have all night. Okay, I'm going to pull this off real quick and show you. You see that impression that's left in there? Uh, by doing that, you can uh, go ahead and turn this thing fairly reliably. Now, when you pull the vacuum on this thing initially, the rice will be pushing, the plastic will be pushing the rice down and getting hard. It's pushing it away from your uh, piece. So you have to keep tightening this thing up to make sure it's tight enough. Now, what this will allow me to do, it'll allow me to top, turn this top surface and uh, get it turned. I can turn the outside. I can do everything except the middle. Anybody with me so far? See what we're doing? Okay, now we don't have time to do the second half, but I'll give you a rough idea how it works. Uh, here we go. 
Here's a ring. I call it a force ring. It's got uh, 19 and a half square inches of surface. If I could take this ring and put it on here like that and pull down on it hard, then it will be, uh, it will give us access to this and be able to do that. Now, in order to do that, it's, it's not trivial. I'm going to use a drawing up here. Where did our markers go? Grab another one. Now, if this is our object that we're trying to hold, okay, we can take and, and make a force ring like this that is going to go over and capture the edges and leave open in the middle the part that you want. Okay? So you take this thing. It's going to wind up like this. Okay? Now, so this force ring, I'm going to make exaggerate a little bit, but it's going to be up here. And am I doing that? No. Getting interference from outside. Oh, okay. Okay, now that is what we want to do. So how do we do it? That's the $64 question right now. What you do, you take this wrap, and that's why I don't have time to do it right now because it's, it's takes a little while. Lay out the uh, stretch wrap on a table and make several layers in different directions. You make a big sheet. You take this and lay down on top of it. And then you wrap it up over the top, just like uh, a candy kiss. Okay, you got it coming up over it. You take this and layer it down over uh, around that center part that's uh, grouped up there. Then you take your plastic and you wrap it around the outside. So what that looks like, this is your stretch wrap plastic. It comes around the bottom and up the center. And we wrap it back around like this. And you got a vacuum chuck down here. And you got all your rice setting here. Okay? So you got all that rice setting there. You bring it down and you seal it on the outside edge. Like so. Now, when you pull a vacuum on there, what happens is that this part right here pulls down and makes a real conformal. Uh, surface to the bottom of that uh, piece just like we have here then the vacuum is inside all this stuff so it pulls that plastic down it pulls that plastic down on top of that ring and shoves the ring into the bowl into the bowl yeah the end result is you can get uh, several hundred pounds of force on there and it's a little bit better than what we were doing earlier with the vacuum chuck because you don't have a smooth surface underneath there you got it uh, pretty well captured. It's conformal coating just like this did. But you got your piece here. Instead of running the plastic down this way, you run it over the top of your piece, up through the ring, and back down. And one of the things that uh, uh, this plastic does is it seals itself. And that was a major breakthrough for me. Uh, yeah? Mm -hmm. You turned as much as you could on the face except for the center. Yes. Now, when you get ready to put that ring on. I have to completely disassemble this. Yeah, and how do you end up not ending up with a different angle on what you originally ordered versus what you're going to have when you try to finish the center? Okay, what you've got is registration problem. Okay? 
And at this point, what I have shown you is not a precision registration. But what you have got is you've got the ability to move it around. You play with it and you get it to where you want it to be. Now, this particular configuration, this is what's been published, it is not precision. But, yeah, and once, once you get the thing in there, you better finish it before you shut it down. Because you come back the next day, you're not going to get it in the same place. Now, there are ways around that. One of the things I came up with, this is a, just a disc, scrap wood. And I put this over the top of uh, vacuum chuck. And I've got another one around here someplace that's the, that's one that's got the aluminum hub on it. This will fit down on that aluminum hub. Yeah, I'll bring it up here. And uh, what we can do. John, I got one minute of film left. One minute of film, okay. Let's work quick. Okay. So if this is a, uh, one of those chucks, the uh, carving stand. So this sits right there like that. Oops, upside down. And these holes are to allow the vacuum up here. Now I can put that on there. And then, here we go. Here's my force ring. It sits down there like that. Then you can bring your plastic underneath and up through here and down around the outside edge. This is what I'm going to use to turn a Chinese ball. And this has the advantage is that you can control the force on the darn thing. When you got one of those mechanical devices, you tighten down screws, you don't know how much force you got. This thing, uh, got 14.6 square inches. I can read my vacuum gauge and I can pretty well determine how much force is on there. And you can reorient it in the whole bit. And it really holds tight if you wanted to.